Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is an assistant curator here at America Society. Um, and we are thrilled to be joined today by Pedro Reyes and also have with us Helis Cabrera herself, who is here to listen to the conversation. Um, and we are here to talk today about her work and her legacy. Um, so I'm here to give a brief bio of Helis before we get started. Um, so Helis is known to be the first woman to have professionally practiced sculpture in Mexico and um, with a career that stretches over the course of 60 years. Her work focuses on the body and its form. And while the subject matter is common to other sculptures from her generation, her approach has always been more lyrical, addressing basic human issues and concerns such as loneliness, love, sexuality, or the experience of motherhood. Her recent exhibitions include here at America Society this summer, and the Museo de Arte Moderno de Mexico in 2021, in Curry Mansuto in 2020, Galleria Agustina Ferreira in 2019, and Museo Experimento El Eco in 2018. So with that, I'll pass it to Chie, who is joining us from America Society as well. Hi everyone, my name is Chie. Uh, I'm also assistant curator at America Society. Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here with Pedro and have the presence of Helis Cabrera, who we are celebrating today. Um, I want to explain the format of this conversation. This is gonna be a conversation between the three of us. Uh, feel free to ask questions on the comment, on the chat, uh, and we will address that in the last 15 minutes of this live. Uh, I'm gonna read Pedro Reyes bio first, and then we can jump into the first questions. So Pedro Reyes uh, studied architecture, but he considers himself a sculptor, although his works integrate elements of theater, psychology, and activism. His work takes on a great variety of forms, from penetrable sculptures to puppet productions. Uh, in 1915, he received the U.S. State Department Medal for the Arts and the Ford Foundation Fellowship. He held a visiting scholar position at MIT for the fall of 2016, and conducted residencies at MIT CAST at the inaugural Dasha Zhukova Distinguished Visiting Artist. And recently, Pedro Reyes was commissioned by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists together with ICAN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, winners of the 2017 Nobel Prize, to raise awareness about the um, Nobel Peace Prize, sorry, to raise awareness about the increasing risk of nuclear conflict, for which he developed Amnesia Atomica that was presented at Times Square, New York City uh, in May 2022 um, at the time of the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference at the United Nations. For his work on, disarm on disarmament, Reyes was granted the Luxembourg Peace Prize in 2021. And at the time, he opened his largest survey to date in Mexico at Marco Museum in Monterrey. In 2022, <laughs> Reyes made his first solo show in Europe at Marta Hertford Museum in Germany, where a large body of his early works were presented. So Pedro and Helis, welcome to this conversation. Um, Hello. I want to start with a question. Um, you know, you are an artist, but you also are a curator. Um, and you have brought a lot of attention to the works of Helis Cabrera in recent exhibitions in Mexico City including one exhibition at Museo Experimental del Leco in 2018. And then um, you also included her in an exhibition, Monumental, uh, at MAM. Um, so we want to start from the beginning. You know, we want to understand uh, how, how you became involved with Helle's work. Uh, what is the history of you two? You know, when did you first encounter her work? Well, um, I first encountered the work of Helle's by bo in books. And then I tried to Google to see if I could find anything about her. And there was absolutely nothing on the internet. The only thing that I found was her phone number. Pick up the phone and rang and Helis picked up. And uh, I told her that I wanted to meet and we went to a little cafe. We're neighbors uh, here in the in Coyoacán. So we went to a little cafe called El Guarache. Recuerdas El Guarache? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then mm -hmm. and then I de I decided to make an interview, which became a series of of interviews. 
and eventually I uh, like uh, it became a necessity to organize a show, which was the show uh, that uh, kind of uh, brought her back to the public attention uh, at Museo El Eco. And the focus of that show was trying to establish that Helles was the first woman to have a solo show. Uh, so um, that was in 1948. And also we, we have to remember uh, Rosario Cabrera, which is her uh, 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 aunt. Rosario Cabrera was uh, uh, a painter in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think that it was, she was like also a, a, one of the first women to to be to to have a successful career as a as a painter. So um, um, I, I mean, we were just like talking about that kind of a, a lineage of 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 her uh, early forma formation. But uh, but that 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 was the beginning of a of a of a kind of a, a beautiful friendship. Um, so I feel very blessed to 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 become a student of Helles. Great. And talking about lineage, uh, besides Rosario Cabrera, who was a painter, um, her family also supported her as a as a sculptor against all the you know schools and colleagues telling her that sculpture is a man's art form. Um, so she had a big support from her family and, and that's beautiful. Um, so you, you mentioned that you, you met her, but have you ever been to her museum? No, because the museum uh, closed uh, in 2006. <laughs> so... Este es de, de Rosario, tu tía. ¿Sí? De Rosario, tu tía. Sí, pero... pero ah, ya se acabó. ¿Sí? La, ya esa expo ya se acabó. Uh, sorry, I, what was the question? Because I, I, I kind of forgot. <laughs> the question was if you, if you had the opportunity to visit the museum before it closed in 2006. The museum was, was uh, kind of closed by then. It was okay. open 40 years. So if it opened in 1966 and it closed in, or it closed in 2014, or, mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Uh, I think it was 2004 that it closed, and mm -hmm. a little like the, the 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 I'm very happy that the exhibit at the American Society has the same name of Museo Escultorico because the spirit of opening a museum free to the public, run by an artist. Uh, I think that gave her practice a public dimension, even if her work was not always monumental. Mm -hmm. So I think that, but but you know, like a, it 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 was uh, uh, from from people who do who I know that remembers visiting the the her museo escultorico. Yeah, it was a little oa oasis, not like a kind of a miracle. Um, the, to 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 find uh, a, a, a free museum, and especially in this neighbor in this area, mm -hmm. there's a lot of schools. Uh, um, so we're in a kind of a, in the middle of several very important uh, music schools and high schools, etc. So it was important for a generation of uh, well several generations of people that were living in the area that mm -hmm. were that had this place where they could is just it like visit definitely there is this dimension aspect of her work 
because of the opening of her museum, but also she produced work in exhibitions uh, in, the, in the subway station, also in Mexico City. Uh, so, so she definitely has this concern about the public. Um, and I'm gonna pick, like you, you mentioned about monumentality and you curated an exhibition uh, about the, monu the, the, the public aspect of sculpture and it's titled Monumental. Uh, I, I'm wondering how was your view of Helle's work in this exhibition? I know that you place Helle's works in two parts of the show and if you could explain a little bit more about that. That's a very good question because precisely uh, her practice uh, has a very long arch from uh, from the nationalist school uh, to uh, land art, no? Uh, uh, so there's a number of experiments that she starts to do in the 50s and 60s. I would say more towards the 60s. And in 1971, there's this exhibit called Formas Ambientales that she made with plexiglass uh, bent. Uh, so um, it, in the 70s, artists uh, uh, made collectives. It was like an era where uh, of los grupos. So when the, the story that Helles tells about how Bucadigo was formed was that in 1974, um, Rosario Castellanos, a very important Mexican writer, died. Uh, she was an ambassador to Mexico in Israel back then. Uh, and the mayor of that time, which was Uruchurtu, uh, called uh, to all the women practicing sculpture uh, to, because they wanted to make a monument to honor uh, Rosario Castellanos. Mm -hmm. And in the meeting, Helles raises her hand. This is what she, has, has, she had told me. And she said, why don't we make a sculpture all of us together? Mm -hmm. And you got to say, how come you say that? You know, like, that's impossible. What about like, you, I mean, it's, who's, you're going to bet the, the eye and the other is going to make the finger or what, no? Uh -huh. So uh, she said, no, 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 we can think of something uh, as a group. Mm -hmm. So she's dismissed by the, most of her colleagues, but at the end of the meeting, Angela Gurria approaches her and tells her, well, you know, like I actually, I think that working in group could be a nice thing. So they didn't end up making the monument to, to Rosario Castellanos, but they certainly formed Bucadigo, which is this uh, uh, Gu for Gurria, K for Cabrera, then D for Diaz, uh, for Luis Diaz, another of the members, and then Go for Geritz, with Matias Geritz. And then this collective went on to do a number of uh, kind of a, a sculptures by the highway uh, in Villahermosa, Tabasco. Uh, there was the president of Ruta de la Amistad, which was this series of sculptures that were made in the in the in in 68 when there was the Olympic Games in Mexico and that was very successful. There was also another very well known uh, kind of a monumental abstract projects that were done since the 50s, no? Because the Torres de Satellite is from 58. So there was this kind of a new school of uh, monumental sculpture that was kind of a in a very uh, uh, conflictive opposition to the uh, nationalist uh, 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 generation. Um, but Helles certainly moved from, 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 from being formed by the, the, being a kind of a, one of the youngest of the, of the, of the, first, of the first half of the century 
to continue making these collaborations and, and, and evolving her vocabulary and her language to doing, uh, in order uh, there to do these uh, large land art pieces that uh, were made along the highway in the tropics. Uh, and we're talking about 75, so... Like, yeah, I, wanna, I just want to show an image of one of those. Can you see that? This is exactly. one work that Hell has made, yeah. Yeah, what is, what is amazing about this work, you know, and, and throughout her work, we see the centrality of the body, right? Her, her sculptural practice is about the, the human body, the female form, etc. And even in a, in a like, public art, in a land art, so monumental like this, she's also still centering the human body in this work because people are supposed to go inside the sculpture and be completely immersed by it. Yeah, I really... And what... Another thing that um, I remembered from Helle's um, collective practice, and, and this, is an, a, this is a sculpture that she created much before, it's 1950, that never actually was uh, realized. Oh, that she oh, has as a maquette. Um, and, and it's really a collective of people dancing. That's right, exactly. For instance, like now we were looking at some of these, of, of these stone carvings that present several people it's like a how do they call it like for some bundling oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like a, a like a group of people that that and and there's always like this idea of a contact mm -hmm. uh, it's curious because also it draw it, it like there's like this kind of a group, group uh, situations. Definitely. There is contact and, and, and on that note, there is also the issue of touch in her They're work. Touching. That is not only what the sculptures are doing, are, are representing, but also what you want to do with the sculptures because of its own materiality, you want to you wanna touch them. I think for instance, like this one is, uh, I find very tender. Uh, it's like a group therapy session. <laughs> where they are kind of a uh, counseling uh, a, a, a one person mm -hmm. and I went this picture to Helles and she was like uh, uh, telling me like that's Matthias oh, wow. <laughs> oh that's wonderful <laughs> and she made a, a portrait of Matthias Goritz yes in sculpture too yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, I want to talk a little bit about um, dance, movement and dance, because we know that Helles was a dancer when she was younger, um, and she trained in the experimental dance uh, atelier of uh, Pallares, who was an architect. And, you know, I, I understand that at to some point, this practice in dance heavily informed her sculptural practice by creating, you know, by, by dealing with the body and bodies that are moving. Um, and I know that you you interviewed her about this. Um, if you could tell us how this, you know, if you know how these workshops happened, and actually, you know, what was the influence of dance in her practice? How how did she view that? Yes, well, um, yes. Even before becoming a, a kind of a professional sculptor, sculptor Helles was a, a part of this dance group. And morpho morphochromophonia was a quite a, a visionary concept because it, there was no choreography. Yeah. It was all based in improvisation. Mm -hmm. So it has these three elements, no morpho, which is uh, the form, uh, then uh, uh, chromo, which is color, and then uh, phono, which is sound. sound. And, uh, and Pallares would play the piano and have a, a setup with filter, uh, uh, filters of color to add to the lights. And then he would uh, play, and according to the notes, the dancers knew 
where there, you know, like it was like a low no, uh, tone, maybe they would like uh, kind of a uh, crawl in the floor, or if it was a higher pitch, they would like jump and try to attempt to fly. Yeah. Uh, or, or there were like kind of a six axis of movement in the body about like moving the arms or moving the waist or moving the head. So it was a uh, uh, quite revolutionary concept that actually was uh, kind of a totally lost uh, uh, because there's a kind of tragic story that mm -hmm. Hilles told me about Payares, that how uh, his archive was uh, kind of uh, destroyed, most of it. And yeah. uh, the, so very little survives of this. The, this is why these kind of a personal accounts of the oral story were important to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to keep because actually uh, there's interest uh, of uh, contemporary dancers that are in a, a kind of a try to put together again the pieces of what this morphochromophonic dance uh -huh. could be. Um, and I believe that certainly that could have been, uh, if not necessarily a direct uh, influence in her sculpture, certainly mm -hmm. just to be in the company of artists. Mm -hmm is already like uh, uh, very important in the formation of, of, of someone. No, even if the art, if, if, you, if you change a yeah. uh, field to- You mentioned- mm. This is a bit of a tangent, but in thinking about a situation like Bayaris where there's not much of an archive, obviously um, Hellas has a huge archive of her work and her life. And that certainly played a big role in putting together our show. Um, and from photographs I've seen of the exhibition you curated at Museo Aleco, um, there was also sort of this really monumental archival display that you and your team put together um, sort of in a timeline kind of format. Uh, and how did you think about the archive or how do you kind of work with the archive in relationship um, to thinking about Hellas's sculpture, or sort of enriching the stories we tell about her artwork. Well, um, you know, it's archives are always very fragile, danger, mm -hmm. because uh, not always there's someone or some institution who would uh, keep them. And mm -hmm. actually, I have to be very uh, kind of uh, grateful and give a kudos to Aime for. In for, because it was through the America Society that we got a small grant to digitalize all the photos mm -hmm. uh, of of of, uh, of 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 Helles, which are now uh, in public access. Uh, 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 and actually, now there's uh, students who are uh, doing uh, well. The, uh, there's a like a. Um, uh, someone doing a master uh, who will do he, uh, her thesis on Museo Escultorico. So mm -hmm. it's very important to to, to kind of uh, 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 kind of a, a fine place for these archives and mm -hmm. and and uh, and and. Uh, um, uh, as a sculptor, uh, 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 I, I've been always very interested in kind of uh, uh, showing the work of the generations that kind of uh, were before us. Um, uh, and it's always a joy to see published a photograph that no one had seen before because mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's so much that it's not available anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. it's internet, not in, in any book. And then uh, happily, uh, from full invisibility uh, five years ago to, to, to the kind of influence that now Helles is having, it's, I think that is a very happy story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, the, the archives were fundamental for the organization of our show here. 
uh, it was super important to to read all the newspaper clippings uh, and photo to see all the photographs so that from from that material we were able to create the threads the conceptual threads for for our show um, and also we were able to show work that uh, we were not able to bring so for example her works on paper on papier mache uh, are presented they exist in the exhibition as as archival material uh, like likewise her works with acrylic you know they are we have a, a, a lot of photographs of those works yes yes i agree um but that there that was not uh, you know like a, a, I don't I, a, a, and and I think that is still a kind of a, a endless uh, um, task because you, obviously a lot of times sculpture is only present in one place no uh, it's not like photograph or film etc that can exist several times several inside several places at the same time so a lot of words we will only know by photos mm, and, yeah. uh, and uh, even i mean oh, uh, one could say that Helis had until re very recently didn't had a market uh, uh, you know, like a, it w was not someone who whose work was perhaps understood by galleries in the period of her mm. time. And happily now, you know, working with Agustina Ferreira, she has been given context and uh, and uh, and suddenly her work has come up incredibly. Fresh. Uh, I think that there's something about a sort of gender fluidity in her work because uh, sometimes you see these figures that are a little bit like hermaphrodite or you know like a, you, don't, you don't know if it's like female or male and there's also this kind of a groups of of um, of, uh, of 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 very loving scenes uh, uh, that now, for instance, in 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 the in 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 uh, in, uh, in the in the kind of uh, a conversation about uh, current conversations about 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 feminism and gender, suddenly become. Uh, very natural and 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 very uh, uh, pertinent, no? And which perhaps I also believe that that the figure, the the, the figure, figurative sculpture, uh, towards the end of the 20th century was punished, no? Was kind of a, a mm, shone down, like you know, like a, it was like a you you would do kind of a sculpture uh, in a more conceptual way. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that most I have learned most from Hell is uh, I, I have to, you know, like a, I would like to give my personal uh, kind of a, a learnings from her is that, you know, that I belong to a generation that we had to think before doing, no, mm -hmm. you know, and I think this is a terrible mistake because you get an intellectual paralysis, no? And uh, and when I ask, because, you know, like a, when I, we were trying to put this archive and these shows together and I show pictures of, of these works to Helis and I ask for the titles, most of the work don't have a title. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea of a sculpture not having a title for me was really yeah. mind-blowing because it, <laughs> that everything that I had to absorb from the work was in the form or in the sculpture. Like I, I, I was not given any clues or any kind of a, 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 a other level of interpretation. So there were no ideas. It was like pure feeling and pure form. And, uh, yeah. and if in, the, in the case of the, of the body, it's like as if her sculptures were the 
the, the true form of the spirit inside the body of people. It's like kind of a, like, or I don't know if I'm saying kind of something weird, but, you know, <laughs> I think that, that, uh, that, 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 that you can tell if a work has a heart. Yeah. Not something that in our kind of uh, a conceptual framework is not often uh, considered, you know, like a, and I like this, but this very much idea of do first mm -hmm. and theory after. One, one thing also to add is that I, I think that um, Helles thought a lot about her, her practice, um, but, but at the same time, like, we know that she didn't create sketches for her, for her works. She would just go and sculpt directly on stone or create directly the models for, for her bronze sculptures. So there is also this, um, yes, as, as you were saying, almost like it, it comes from the heart, right? Mm -hmm. She's not overly thinking about every single detail of the sculpture, but in the end, they end up being those amazing uh, human figures that really are in between abstraction and figuration. And we know that the essence that she wants to put in the sculpture is there. You know, whatever she wants to convey in each work is very, is a, is very obvious, uh, even though the details are very subtle in, in her works. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I agree. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's with your hands, no? Which is what, you know, like, uh, a, or, or doing with your hands is, is, is very, it's very hard today, you know, like, a, is it, because a lot of times, uh, oh, you know, like, a, we artists today would do anything to avoid touch, avoid, like, getting our hands, like, a, there, there's so much kind of theory that is kind of uh, expected to, to be in the work. And uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, that the, the the one of the kind of uh, mysteries uh, uh, to own, to 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 find in every of these cultures is because you know like they can be very easily dismissed as mm -hmm. as as, uh, as as just like a kind of a. Uh, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that you have to come back to the sculptures many, many times, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. you and reveal yeah. to you uh, those feelings kept inside the sculpture, and uh, so these they're not the illustration of ideas. Uh, they're kind of vessels for 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 human emotions. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And as you, you talked about, you know, this process of making sculpture that sometimes you go back many times. Uh, what, what do you think, you know, has Hellas influenced your practice and, and how? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, um, for instance, one case that I find very important that I'm just starting to uh, kind of uh, understand because sometimes it takes several years to understand. Uh, I have to confess that I I did not didn't like all the work at the first sight. You know, like a, a lot of the work has been growing on me, mm -hmm. and uh, for instance, like the 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 the, the work that I like very much now is all the work made in papier mache. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the newspaper and uh, I, this is because uh, well she you know like you have to understand that Helles had to live three parallel lives one <laughs> as a high school teacher which was her day job so to speak another as a mother raising five kids mm -hmm. and then another as an artist so uh, with her high school students, uh, when they ask her about that, they, if, they, if, they, if she wanted to encourage them to make sculpture, 
they would say that they had no money to buy supplies. Mm -hmm. Actually, sculpture can be a expensive practice. So mm -hmm. she said, you know, this is no, never an excuse. And, uh, and she showed her how to, you know, like I just like grab a uh, almost no uh, uh, so um, this actually goes back to a very early formation of hers because her family had uh, um, a business where they were doing uh, decorations uh, like the ones that you have in the kind of a uh, Art, art deco, art, art nouveau houses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, or neoclassic kind of uh, motifs mm -hmm. that are paper pushed into a form that is like a wooden carving that you. Paper. So she, as a, as a, as a, as a girl, you know, when she was very young, uh, uh, kind of uh, started helping doing these paper decorations. And I think that yeah. uh, that this is like when she really started sculpting. And this is also her very late practice. You know, the kind of, uh, uh, because uh, stone carving, for instance, is something that is kind of be very, kind can, can have a high cost on your body. You know, like a, 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 it, 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 it means a lot of effort. Uh, so actually, she has continued to work in some of these paper uh, um, uh, figures. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I don't know, I mean, like today, uh, we're thinking also in alternatives for making art that has a smaller ecological footprint mm, yeah. mm. Uh, you That's know like keeping sometimes is you know now it's like four times more than what it used to be etc so mm -hmm. so this resource of of the papel mache if done right because you know like a, 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 a I think that 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 Part of the kind of a learning that I'm very interested in seeing, seeing okay, well, you know, like at this kind of a so humble technique that yeah. we kind of uh, a, uh, are a bit of, uh, scared of because, you know, like it's what we make piñatas and all that kind of thing mm. that kind of is, is uh, associated with something cheap. But, you know, uh, I believe mm -hmm. that also if if you control the the, the, the the technique, then you can do something beautiful uh, always. No? So, I mm -hmm. mean, you have one, you know, the, the thing is that uh, you asked me, what have I learned? No, uh, I have, I could go on and telling you many other things, for instance. Yeah, definitely. I just want to show the logo of the company from her family. Uh, that produce papier mache for houses in in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So there is also this issue, you know, her connection with architecture is is very present throughout her life, uh, from her family and then the uh, morphochromophonic dance uh, practice that was led by an architect. Um, so and and then her own public sculptures, which are uh, by nature very architectural. Uh, and I also want to show some images of her. Papier mache sculptures uh, in a 1990s exhibition. What fascinates me about this is how she is displaying this, these figures on space. You know, they are, you know, coming from all sides of the gallery space, from from the top, from the corners, all the spaces that we normally don't utilize in a gallery. She's occupying with those figures. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and I, I see that she also did that in her own. With photo, in, in photographs of her Museo Escultorico, mm -hmm. uh, in which the sculptures are occupying the entire space of that of that garden, right? Mm -hmm. Even the niches on the walls, the corners. 
It's true, it's true. You know, like something that, uh, you know, like a, the base of a sculpture is always a big issue because, I mean, if something we have learned from Brancusi is like the base is part of the sculpture. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so either you want bases to be invisible or bases to be, to have like a kind of a very tectonic and sculptural quality. But yeah. in this case, she totally goes out without bases and the sculptures are suspended in the air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, or, she, or she creates her own bases, mm -hmm. right? With, with, with like cheap daily materials like construction pipes and, and acrylic. And brick. Yeah, yeah and we, brick. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of conversations about her attention to how the work was installed up to that, you know, paper mache show where it's much more avant-garde presentation, but even from the very beginning of her career in terms of, you know, shows in the 60s where the tables were all at different heights. So it was much more dynamic to look at the sculptures and always having this intentionality with how her work was presented or in the backyard at the Museo Escultorico um, with the brick niches and things like that. And this kind of interplay between the materials of the pedestals and the materials of the, of the sculptures. Um, and I think there's sort of like this attention to the materials in the display in addition to the sculptural works themselves. But yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I and and talking about, you... about materials, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that, that you know, like I can tell that you okay. can do no, brick. I, now that we're talking about in a feeling or environment yeah. you're in your, your in the exhibition that you created because you know like it has this kind of feeling of the Museo Escultorico that was open air and a little bit like a garden no oh yeah. well, that's very nice of you to say that was our goal so <laughs> we're <laughs> glad it transmits that feeling <laughs> yes yeah so yeah thank you um and and talking about materials in her work she has in a, I, I view her work as very modernist too, because of her interest in materiality. Like every, every, you know, all of her sculptures, you know, the stone looks like stone, and wire will look like wire, uh, paper will look like paper, etc. Um, and and I, I think this is really fascinating about her practice. And and you know, it's a very modernist um, thing to do, obviously. And and thinking about this legacy of modernism, where would you see? her practice within, uh, you know, this large history of, of modern Mexican sculpture? Mm. Well, it's very interesting question because I think that uh, that, that precisely the fact that she has like kind of a, a part of her practice that belongs to different moments, mm -hmm is uh, kind of a bridge story of, of, of it, like her own life has, was kind of a, the development of a very radical transformation in our understanding of sculpture. Um, and so I think that, you know, like a, she cannot be placed in one era. She belongs mm -hmm. to several eras, no? Mm -hmm. she, she, like a, Definitely, she belongs to the Escuela Mexicana, no, like the Re Mexican Renaissance, uh, uh, and also she belongs to the uh, Cultura Urbana movement of the '60s and '70s, no, and then also to the groups in the in the in the in the '70s and '80s, uh, and uh, and now to the 21st century, because she's all <laughs> kind of taking part in these group shows with artists that are 50 years younger than her, mm -hmm. or 50 years younger than her. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, I think that is very, that, that you know, she suddenly appears in these different moments in history. She's a time traveler. <laughs> no, it's so, it's so, so true. Uh, I mean, also thinking about, you know, the ways in which um, she sort of carved out a lane for herself as a female sculptor. And I think also we had conversations about how her sculptures um, represented female figures and different types and kinds of femininity and how that was kind of unique and an interesting aspect to her practice um, throughout the different works. Um, 
I wonder, um, also like thinking about her creating her own museum in the 60s as this kind of like very revolutionary action. I mean, what do you think about the her, her museum's place in sort of an even different history and trajectory of art museums and museography in, in Mexico in, in the 20th century? Yes, well, you know, like a, it's kind of a tradition for artists to have in Mexico to kind of a create certain institutions or museums. Mm -hmm. The difference with Helles is that, you know, like she made that without the support of anyone. Mm -hmm. Because uh, perhaps she didn't have the connections or, or her pieces weren't actually selling. And mm -hmm. she, nevertheless, she wanted to uh, uh, share them with, uh, with the public. So... Uh, initially, when she conceived the uh, Museo Escultorico, she tried to make it a kind of a museum for sculptors, not only for her own work, but for other sculptors. No? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, there was a certain skepticism uh, from other sculptors that was, they were saying, but what is this? Is this a gallery? Uh, are you going to sell the work? Who's going to kind of uh, profit from this? Are you, are, and she said, no, you know, like I, the idea is just to have a museum, the, like a, a space devoted to sculpture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I, uh, so it ended up being a, a place to, to where she was showing uh, her work, although there were other few exhibits uh, of, for other, from other artists. But uh, I think that the, that is very important to be in close contact with sculpture because sculpture is not something that can be reproduced. I mean, like a, if you see a photograph, you're only seeing one side of a sculpture. You have to really mm -hmm. be able to walk around the sculpture, get, cl get close to it, touch it if possible, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, 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 so, so the idea of space is very important. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this, idea of Museo Escultorico, then, you know, like, a, I can see a very important influence of Helles in uh, Espacio Escultorico, for instance, which is made in 78. Mm. No? Because if you see her land artwork from 75 that has this kind of a triangular pieces that you walk in between, mm -hmm. you can see then how three years after uh, another collective that she didn't belong to, but, you know, like, again, it was kind of a a common uh, 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 member, uh, mm -hmm. you see the influence of, of, of her in this and, uh, and also this idea of, uh, uh, as you mentioned, you know, like a, like transit, no, of, of, of you know, like a, what, one of the transformations that happened in sculpture in the, the 60s and 70s is that instead of walking around the sculpture, you walk a, a, a through the sculpture. No, like a, like sculpture becomes space, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then 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 it mm -hmm. that leads to Asian or site specificity and many other things. Uh, but the idea of a discrete entity that that is kind of a, a like the model or the carving or you know like a or the statue etc. sort of like explodes and becomes a space and environments and light and movement and all these uh, 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 transformations that happen in those decades, no? um, mm -hmm. which she did, you know, like a, she, with the 71 show of Formas Ambientales, mm -hmm. this kind of a, a light, uh, like working with colored plexiglass, light had mm -hmm. an important element. And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, uh, is curious because it's quite daring to uh, not be fixated with a style. Mm -hmm. A lot of times sculptors, actually I think that a mark of success in a sculpture is to create a style. I mean, if you ah. see sculpture and you can tell who made it without reading mm -hmm. the label, mm -hmm. that's already a, an accomplishment, no? You, you can... Mm -hmm. You 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 created a, a, a personal style, mm -hmm. but you know like a, 
she did that, but she also changed format so much yeah. that uh, that is uh, a, a kind of a very very daring thing to do, not to kind of a start over in a t totally different technique. Definitely. And it's not that she creates one sculpture with a different technique. She creates a whole body of sculptures <laughs> and full exhibitions uh, with paper, acrylic, uh, and also wire, metal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Um, one thing that we want to do is to also open space for questions. Uh, please feel free to ask questions in the, in the comment box. We will be at, we will be. Yes. We have a few, a few minutes left <laughs> before. Instagram Live kicks us out. So we've so enjoyed this conversation. That's been so illuminating. Thank you so much, Pedro. And it's been such a joy having Hellas here with us. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of fans saying that they're, they're you know, appreciate her work. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you have a lot of fans. <laughs> fans. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any One, question that we can answer? We, no, there are no questions yet. Uh, but, but I can ask more questions. Yeah, we, we have plenty of questions. <laughs> okay, Amanda Martinez is saying it was a joy. I, I think everyone can see those questions now. But, hey, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a joy to see the exhibition, very moving. A lot of love, a lot of love. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about, you know, this issue of scale in her work mm -hmm. um, and thinking if, with uh, Guca de Gose, one of the collectives that she participated, mm -hmm. she created a smaller exhibition of the smaller sculptures in the world. Um, and there, <laughs> there, is a, there is an aspect of, of humor in this, right? And, and that confronts with the, with the very serious aspect of her public work. Um, but yes. yeah. This is a, this was kind of a, 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 a rather radical experiment, no? The idea of uh, having mm -hmm. a, a sculpture that you almost had to see in the microscope, no? Mm. Where kind of a like like really like two millimeters wide, no? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it's a sort of kind of a inverted monumentality, no? because uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of uh, look at them? You have to have a magnifying glass or something. And I think that that was like also very playful. And this it was uh, the idea that by then, this collective was called Bucadigoseta, mm. because it incorporated uh, other members like Herbert Bayer, Mm -hmm. Tamayo, Sebastian, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Angela Gurria and Angeles Cabrera and the, and the others. No, but every time that one member was added to the group, the collective name was growing. <laughs> yes. It, it, so it was kind of a almost like a concrete poetry, no? Yeah. 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 No, I think I think there's so many ways in which Hellas worked that kind of challenged sort of traditional ideas about being an artist, like how you were speaking about how as a sculptor, you might want to create a visual signature, but Hellas was always experimenting. Or as an artist, you might keep your work in your studio and not necessarily have the public in, but Hellas founded a museum where the public could come in. And, you know, Hellas also worked collaboratively, which is not, you know, like obviously, individual artists, you know, operates um, on their own, right? Um, so Hellas is kind of always challenging and breaking these molds um, that had maybe been set out in the 19th and early 20th centuries for artists. So, so yeah, Pedro, I want to invite though, any final thoughts as we come into our final minutes? Well, no, just to, just to, we want to express our gratitude, uh, you know, to, to, for, to, to you for curating the show, to Jaime in America Society, with to ever Agustina uh, uh, Ferreira who supported the, the show, to everyone uh, who is uh, seeing this transmission and hasn't had a chance to check out the show. I don't know for how much more days will be open. Oh yeah, closing the yes, it'll be closing on July thirtieth and. 
thank you again. We'll have two minutes now, so I'll say we'd like to thank everyone as well. And also, again, mention um, Aime Iglesias Lucan, who couldn't be with us today, but was another co curator of the show and the chief curator here at America Society. Um, please visit our website for more information on the show. And if you can't join us in New York, um, we have installation photos there for you to view. And thank you again, Pedro, and thank you, Hellas. It was such a joy to have you here with us today. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Hellas. Such Great. an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Hellas. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, gracias. Bye.